Hey guys, we're UNSW, and today we're going to walk you through our solution, which is a private third party comparison service. So, to start off, I'm going to walk you through a consumer journey. That is Sally. So, Sally logs on, she gives access through open banking, she logs on through Gmail or Facebook, and she arrives at this screen. Now, what's really, really important is the fact that we're only offering one choice here. Now, that's really significant. Consumers get incredibly confused when you have more than one choice. Now, note that we're not um, restricting the decision. We're, we're still providing options to opt out, but rather we're trying to um, make the choice more efficient. Um, you'll note under your savings, we have one figure that represents the um, impact of the choice of the switch over the following year. So that represents the net savings, including monetary conversion of insurance and travel points, as well as interest repayments. Now, you'll note here this particularly enticing option, which is called Get Money Now. And that's a unique idea that we've implemented to try and sort of catch the users that won't initially engage with the first option. So if they're quite reticent to initially join it on, we might entice them with this option. And what this does is it allows us to offer the user um, money now, right now. And this plays, of course, on present bias, as other groups have mentioned. And what this does is it brings the tangibility of the investment earlier, instead of the savings being diffused over multiple months. Um, it's important to note that we have de-emphasized the switch button there, and we've re-emphasized the back button. And that's important because this choice isn't the optimal one. It's just something that is there to catch people who wouldn't otherwise switch. So it's really important to have this sort of thing so we have a two-tier approach within this stage. Um, and finally, we've gone for a very minimalist screen. And you can see there's helpful prompts if you want to know more information about the repayment structure and about how the net savings are actually computed. So that's actually the first phase of our approach. The second phase is for users who perhaps didn't switch immediately when they signed up, or those who switched, but then the conditions in the market or their behaviors changed significantly. So it's really important to have this dynamic process where we constantly reevaluate our behavioral interventions and make sure that we have the optimal solution. So as you can see on the top, there's a number of behavioral biases that we're working towards, which will be expanded on later. Um, what's really important is this lower half. Now, it looks kind of confusing, but what it actually represents is a major policy intervention. And what we're seeking to do, which is quite ambitious, we'll admit, is we want banks, we want to enforce banks to actually share anonymized random sample of their consumers across products um, and sharing that annual net cost. And what that allows us to do is inform our behavioral interventions behind the scenes. And it's a really powerful measure in terms of coming up with that powerful prompt and nudge uh, further along the line for those who didn't switch immediately. So I just want to give you guys the key insight that we've, we've gained from our research using Hilda into how people actually use their credit cards in Australia. Um, so a lot of you are probably aware that only around 35% of credit card holders leave balances outstanding and thus incur interest charges. Um, this suggests that only around a third of credit card holders can gain substantially from switching their credit card. Um, so people that hold balances or maintain balances are called revolvers. Uh, people that don't are called transactors. Um, but this is actually, there's actually larger gains, we think, because we follow transactors over time. And people that are transactors that always pay off their balance usually do fall out of that state over time. After about six years, around 40% of transactors have fallen out of that state. Um, so th these are the details. These are the mechanics and feasibility of our comparison service. I'll leave most of this to come out during the Q&A, but the things I want to highlight are that the money now option is the commercial basis of this service. That's how it makes money. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is that we think that release of an anonymized random sample of consumer data is necessary to galvanize competition, even though, and even though it's quite a big thing because it requires a change to the open banking rules. Cool, so now onto the behavioral side of things. Uh, we've taken a multifaceted approach in, in applying the behavioral insights uh, to our user interface. And what makes our comparison service unique is the way in which we tackle the issues of choice overload, bounded rationality, and present bias. So on the issue of bounded rationality, you've heard a lot of propositions today that emphasize the importance of allowing consumers to specify what, what uh, attributes of their credit card are important to them. We think this is wrong. 
Experimental results indicate that consumers make significantly more suboptimal choices when they're choosing a product that has several attributes. Now, for that reason, we've aggregated the vector of product attributes into a single scalar dollar value, which is that $500 there. Now, that's a number that's a dollar amount which is going to be familiar to consumers and which is going to contain all of the necessary information uh, for them to make an informed decision. We also recognize that psychology tells us that decision makers don't like to make trade-offs. And in order to circumvent this dislike of choices and consequentially the choice overload, what we've done is not only aggregated the product attributes, but we've aggregated the choices that they have to make. We have a single recommended card, and what we're offering them is the optimal choice for them. This reduces the consumer's decision to that of a dichotomy, either switch or don't. And I'd like to emphasize here that we're not reducing the option set for the consumer, we're merely reducing the number of choices that they have to make. Now, we recognize that this uh, there, there may be some consumers for whom this does not entice. The, the potential for future gains that are not immediately recognized is not enough to entice people, and this is a manifestation of present bias. And so this is one way that we could remedy this is by bringing some of those gains forward, which is exactly why we developed the Get Money Now option. Now, this will provide Sally with tangible gains today that she can pay back later. And we emphasize via color heuristic that this is not actually optimal for Sally. She would be $50 better off taking the initial option, but we believe that for present biased agents, this will be enough to nudge them in the right direction. Now, let me tell you a story about social comparison. We have Sven and his neighbor Boris. They both own goats, but Boris has an extra goat. Sven is definitely not happy about this. Sven also has a cousin, Nikolai, in the county next in the next county. And Nikolai owns mansions. Nikolai has an extra mansion. Sven doesn't really mind this because, well, Nikolai owns mansions. But Boris has an extra goat. Boris's goat should drop dead. Our email implements social comparison and reminders to reduce inattention and inertia uh, in Sally. That's helping her make the best choice she can. Our comparison service is quite simple, and that's easily extendable, feasible, and scalable. Our first extension is to have the comparison service run as a public government institution. The government comparison service improves both the welfare of the market and the feasibility, as the service can be privatized in the future. Another extension is to link the government service to all the market services after submitting a tax return, thus praying off loss aversion. The service mo model is easily scaled into other financial products and other industries as the biggest change required is that to the index. From the release of the anonymized run of random data, this will galvanize competition, increase the interaction, support, and use of the consumer data right. Thank you for listening. So just to check on this magical algorithm, is it trying to find the absolute, what information is it using to find this best option? So, and it's, so it's absolute, it's, it's monetizing everything, um, all of the benefits and features of a credit card into a minimum net cost. We think that's entirely possible for a credit card. The only feature of a credit card that I think it's hard to put a dollar value on is the liquidity benefit. Um, but everything else you can put a dollar value on, rewards points, there's published data on how much they're worth, insurance, there's a market for it. Um, interest paid, obviously we've got a dollar amount, fees we've got a dollar amount. So it's monetizing everything um, and putting that into a single dollar index that we use to choose the best product. Um, liquidity is, is different and we have a question there on that first page where we're trying to catch whether people have changed their liquidity needs a, a lot and what we'd probably do is direct them to a different comparison service. And it's optimizing based on uh, a person's previous behavior in previous terms behavior. of assuming that they've... It's going, to, it's going to take their current balance and their previous behavior to kind of project their behavior over the current year. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about initial consent provision? Because that wasn't really a focus of your presentation. Yeah, so we haven't thought about that at all. We chose challenge one. We, we haven't looked at challenge two. You've got the, the get money now options in it, like an interesting idea. I mm -hmm. guess the, the, the feasibility of the comparison site depends a lot on trust. Mm -hmm. And it seems like having that option in there with you know quite high effective interest rates mm. uh, creates a risk for trust. Um, is there any more ways that you could manage manage that risk for the service? Um, I think, well, like one, it, it 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 kind of initially looks like payday lending. It's like my God, this is terrible. But the way that we would actually manage it is it, we limit the amount of the the savings that we take away the, to the from the consumer to about twenty percent. We'd never do more than that. So even though it sounds like payday lending. 
anyone who takes that option is still getting an enormous benefit that they would not otherwise get. So I think it's a, it's a bit more palatable than it initially sounds. Um, and yeah, so the beauty of it as well is that these um, third parties have all this financial data and they can actually um, construct algorithms and they become experts in assessing that credit risk. So it's like the exact people that we want to be able to aggregate, you know, pull the risk and be able to make money over a, a large enough sample. Thanks, guys.